Hey guys, welcome to the show. Uh, we are here with Ethan from Camera Dactyl that's come to visit in Bilbao. And uh, we're doing a different little video. We're gonna have a conversation on the story and history of where Camera Dactyl is going. Because I feel like a lot of people probably don't know about Camera Dactyl and if they know, they maybe just pass through it because they think it's not an interesting project. Because, you know, sometimes the looks of the camera can, you know, dissuade people from the usual modern look of like DSLRs, mm -hmm. SLRs, Leica cameras and such. But they're nothing far from being a toy. Like, I, I don't think they're toyish at all. They do sometimes look clunky, but there's an explanation to that. And Ethan will tell us all about it. So Ethan, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Nico. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to hear. Uh, you see our sofa setup is very comfortable and welcoming. So Ethan. Super close. <laughs> yeah, we're super close. We're like, Hello. so Ethan, <laughs> Let me know, how did camera dactyls start? Um, so for years and years I bought and sold cameras, mm -hmm. uh, much like Camera Rescue, but like on a much smaller scale in the mm -hmm. States. Um, and I've been to 50 states and sort of bought all the cameras that were at a reasonable price to buy and sell. And um, I kind of got into other things, buying and selling stores going out of business, building uh, industrial electronics and um, like electromechanical things for breweries. Mm -hmm. um, and one day I had a 3D printer sitting on my desk that I had bought just to laser etch PCBs for making circuit boards. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just sitting there staring me in the face on my desk for like weeks as I waited for some chips to come in from China. I thought like, uh, maybe I could 3D print a camera. So I, you know, uh, spent a couple of weeks drafting and uh, I made my first 3D printed camera. It was like based on a Deerdorf, uh, people were really into it. It took way too long to build, um, and I sold you know a bunch of them, which was painful. It took like months and months to fill all my Kickstarter orders, um, but you know I got. So yeah. to not to cut you out, but like for those who don't know, all of Camera Dactyl's cameras are three D printed. He started. I found him out for the news on that Kickstarter project, which was a field camera that was 3D mm -hmm. printed. Uh, had a lot of multicolor options, which was very attractive visually. Uh, or fun, people hated it. Visually. Or hated it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always a love hate with things, uh, especially with Kickstarters too. And like the bellows would be fun. There were like some that had like mm -hmm. Hawaiian prints or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it was very fun. So that's how it all started. Uh, you got. Uh, you fulfilled your Kickstarter. I mean, you raised the money you wanted. Mm -hmm. You built the cameras, but that camera, you said, you told me that you kind of set it aside. It was way too much time to build them. Yeah, you know, I was selling them for like 200 bucks or something like mm -hmm. that. And they took 144 hours just to print the parts with no printer failures. And then, you know, two or three hours to assemble the bellows and about six hours to completely, you know, finish the camera. And just, you know, I spent a month and a half, almost two months filling that camera. Uh, Kickstarter campaign, which was fun. It got my name out there. I met people all over the world, people interested in Well, you got my attention, so that helped. Hey, now I'm famous. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it was really great. I don't regret it, but it was like for what I would have to sell those cameras today to be worth my while. Like, I think you could go out and buy a really, really beautiful camera that's not made by me. And so I haven't really been selling them. You know, I have some other designs that are similar that I make, mm -hmm. might make, you know. Yeah, so you off. stopped pushing the field camera dactyl yeah. cameras, which were the, it was a camera dactyl, what was the name of the model? Uh, it was just the camera dactyl four by five field camera. Yeah. I don't think it had Because the, yeah, then you started then. with the naming. So yeah. what, right now <laughs> in my hand, I have the camera dactyl OG. What does OG stand for? Uh, I don't know, original gangsta. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> which is a four by five point and shoot sort of camera. It does have a tripod mount and uh, you can focus. It has a focusing screen on the back. Um, it takes different lenses mm -hmm. with different lens cones, of course. So this was probably your second uh, release. I know you design yeah. a lot of cameras meanwhile that probably never make it to the general public. Yep. Um, but this was a second release which Filled the void of something portable, uh, let's say inexpensive, because they're pretty inexpensive. They're less than a lens, which mm -hmm. is great, unless you're buying maybe some lucky lens. And uh, they're tough, you can handheld them, and they were kind of like a travel wide, but travel wide, we all know, went away, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had no news there. So, this is your second model you've been releasing. Mm -hmm. How has it been doing? Uh, great, actually. So, um, to fill that Kickstarter campaign, I needed to buy like, 
I don't know, 10 or 11 3D printers. I filled my back room with 3D printers and mm -hmm. mess everywhere, just printing and printing like 10 nonstop for a month. And so I had all of these printers and actually uh, Matthew Joseph, who's like the webmaster for the Sunny 16 podcast, mm -hmm. contacted me. He said, you know, hey, can you just make me this uh, like a handheld 4x5 for... I think it was a 47 millimeter super angulon XL, a really wide lens. Yeah. And I said, sure, you know, the f I can do that for, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks, but the first one's going to cost like $10,000, right? Because of the time, the research, the thing, <laughs> all sure. of that, of course, takes time. That's one of the things that people, when they see one of these cameras, like once you've set the design and you kind of nailed all the issues because 3D printing has advanced a lot. Mm -hmm but the 3D printing tolerances are not maybe what people expect all the time. So I know that a lot of your cameras, like you can't sell because the, it doesn't have exactly the mm -hmm. tolerance you accept. So, you know, building the first one is always very expensive. Then mm -hmm. once you've got it, maybe every now and then what, 5%, 10% uh, of your cameras don't make it because of failures. Sure, yeah, I mean, or 10% or of the pieces, mm -hmm. they never make it into a camera. Yeah, but, well, um, all of the pieces, there's different pieces on each camera. Yeah, and so like what a lot of people don't understand is like when you have uh, automated um, manufacturing, um, like whether it's CNC milling or laser cutting or uh, 3D printing, right? Mm -hmm. It makes, once you've come up with a design that all of the tolerances and mechanisms work well, um, then you can produce them pretty quickly if you've thought about how you produce them. Mm -hmm. But the first one, you know, this took up almost a month. Um, you know, I've got boxes like this full of prototypes that I should probably throw out. Um, just, you know, I print something, I try and fit it together. It wouldn't fit or fit too tight or, you know, just wouldn't or work quite loose, right. Or, or I didn't like how the mechanism works. And then I would, you know, change it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it would start with like, 15 different helix designs that had nothing to do with the camera. It was just like a cup that would yeah. expand. And for those who don't know, a helicoid heli helix is this, which is what in most modern lenses you don't see because it's internally mm -hmm. here you sort of see it coming out because it's easier to print like this. If it had to be hidden, it would be way bigger and uh, maybe mm -hmm. not as convenient and cheap. Mm -hmm. So this was your 4x5, which we've seen Eduardo Pavis shooting with mm -hmm. it. I'll be doing a shooting video now that we've uh, set mine. So I highly recommend. I'll leave that on the links and everywhere that you can find it. But Eduardo has a great channel. And now you've been working on other models. What do you have on your right hand? Yeah, so um, this is the Camerodactyl Homunculus <laughs> 6x9. Um, it's basically just... Um, you say it's like a Mamiya Press lens and a Graflex uh, 23 or Mamiya RB or yeah, the, well, the Graflock Mini I would consider yeah. naming it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, from what I've seen in the camera, we've been a day together. The Graflex Universal lenses or the press lenses mm -hmm. have a helical built in already, so you don't have mm -hmm. to print that like this because this is a large format lens that doesn't have any focusing mechanism and it usually is bellows. Here you have it mounted on the lens, and uh, so it's easy, it's kind of like a bayonet mount, mm -hmm. uh, which you were taking off. And um, then the back is a mini graph lock, which is usually the RB67, the Mamiya Press or Universal. No, not the Mamiya Press Not the Mamiya Press Those backs? do not fit. They're, okay. I want to make that point. Uh, okay. The Mamiya press backs that are the S-curved style, oh, okay. uh, they don't fit. They but don't fit. All of the Graflex backs, the Mamiya backs, the Horseman Graflex style, okay. um, those will all fit. So this would be more like a 6x9 at the biggest mm -hmm. to a 6x, do they do 6x45? Yep. 6x45 yep. on the smallest, uh, kind of like a point and shoot camera because you won't be seeing what you're focusing unless you do put like a ground glass which probably makes it mm -hmm. defeats the purpose of the camera I think not that you can't do it. Yeah, it has a viewfinder So you kind of hyperfocal focus you can put a range mm -hmm. finder. He's got a cold shoe on the side here uh, Yeah, I won't focus there <laughs> uh, because we've set oh, right, focus right. here and like so it's basically a more portable medium format camera and the good thing is that you can use this 50 millimeter um, Mamiya lens, 65 millimeter, they have a 90, 100, uh, 2.8, 100, 2, F, yeah, 2.8, 3.5, and then a bunch of other glass mm -hmm. because it's all the same mount. Yep. And then focusing, of course, as I said, is on the lens already. So this is your medium format. Uh, How is this one doing? Um, this one's doing really well. So like um, the first camera that I made, that field camera took, uh, 140 some odd hours and almost like 
maybe six to eight hours to mm -hmm. assemble the thing. Um, this four by five takes, you know, 40 some odd hours to print and like an hour or two to totally trim and assemble. Mm -hmm. um, this thing, you know, comes off the printer in 20, 30 hours. And like, you know, if I'm having a good day, I can assemble them in 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer. But um, yeah, they're, um, because of that, pretty cheap. You know, it's not like the cheapest thing in the world, but they're. Well, but these are sold at $120? $120, yep. US dollars. So $120, $200. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a medium format camera that accepts lenses and helical is already built by Mamiya. Not that this helical is bad, but the Mamiya right. one, of course, is metallic, Smooth. was way more like uh, mainstream, so they're mm -hmm. well made. Um, and, you know, they could do it all. And the glass is great. And the backs are, you know, Mamiya blacks or horseman backs, mm -hmm. so they're also really nice. And, and they're really find, yeah, they're cheap, cheap. and affordable yeah. to find. So one hundred twenty dollars for the camera, probably like what a, a deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then like fifty bucks maybe minimum for a lens, another fifty yeah. bucks for the back. You got a medium format point and shoot for a pretty low price. Yeah, it could be like a do it yourself, which is not. Mm -hmm. uh, Hasselblad SWC, I feel like the 50 millimeter on a six by nine would have a wider. Yeah, field so of view. if you were to crop the SWC down to like six four five to get a rectangle, it's less wide than the 50 on a mm -hmm. six by nine. But if you're cropping the 50 into six by six it's for square, less, it's yeah. less wide than the SWC. But you know, it's cheaper. It's a the 50 is a super nice uh, biagon. And. Um, one couple things, if I can hold it for a second. The grip comes off. He's got grips that you can put on both sides, which is pretty cool. I'm just saying it because he's not yeah. saying it. Then he's got like viewfinders on the side, like cold shoes on every single side. So you can attach like a light meter on a side, a range finder, another side, a bubble level. And mm -hmm. like, so it's pretty, it's like, you know, how do you say? You can build it to your own way, so customizable. Like Legos. Yeah, like $120 is not a lot. It does bring the, the. let me see if I can pull it out. Can you pull it out? No, it's locked. Oh, locked where? It's locked when it's locked. Oh, okay. So, okay, so you can unlock and remove the lens. Okay, so that's how you mount the lens. So it's pretty cool that you can just turn it and then you can put any lens, so you can change the lenses. Any Mamiya press lens, not any any lens. Yeah, any Mamiya press lens, uh, which they all come in the same sort of fit mount. Um, so yeah, but this one's very exciting. It does have a tripod mount if you want to put a tripod on it and shoot it, you know, with a little viewfinder. Viewfinders mm -hmm. are not optical. There's just a cut out plastic 3D but it gives you a sense of it and i'm sure by shooting more of it you get a better glimpse just yeah. like i have on the travel wide on the swc i ended up shooting the hasselblad swc without the viewfinder right. i already knew what was going to be in so everything you can see everything yeah basically <laughs> you could see you could shoot and it was pretty great um so that's the homunculus yeah and it'll also i mean I'll take the back off here it's got these tabs you know yeah, that's like a mini graph lock, basically, which is if you anyone knows the graph lock backs for four by fives will let you use different, you know, Polaroid backs and all these things. Well, this is the same thing, but the mini version of it. Yeah. And so also this, um, uh, you might have mentioned this grip is symmetrical, so it can be mounted on this side or this side. You just need a screwdriver to or two take these. to shoot. Yeah, like my, that. my buddy Han has been shooting with his like this. It comes with one grip um, and then I make these finders. Um, you know, custom to like the what lenses. your film format and mm -hmm. your lens is. Um, and then you could also get a second grip if you want to shoot both yeah. grips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing you've been <laughs> I've selling. I've only had one person do that. I probably will want two grips okay. just for the fun I'll of like shooting with a 50. Grips. Well, sure. 50 probably will get my hands in the in the picture. But like um, another thing you were mentioning. This guy's super durable. Is something So like everybody always thinks like, oh, you make plastic cameras, they're going to break. They're gonna, like. You know, the, uh, it doesn't have a range finder. It's a limited camera, right? It's not metal, but it's, you know, the body is under a pound when you strip, like, if you the take lens the lens off, off and the back off, um, you know, you're, like, it weighs. Um, I mean, it's a black box, just like yeah. any camera. Yeah, it's not rocket science, right? It's just a black box, but it weighs less than a pound, whereas a Mamiya Press weighs four pounds plus. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a range finder that decalibrates every other day. Yeah, it's very fragile right and so okay this is not as strong as like a nikon f because it's not made out of metal but it's more durable right because like you can hit it it's like nothing it's just a 
block of it's yeah. a plastic brick. He right? dropped it last night. And <laughs> yeah, it, did. a, it didn't break. My strap came off. <laughs> yeah, strap came off. So what else kind of cameras have you been working on? Can you share a little um, bit more with, with sure. us? Sure. Uh, I'll tell you about some of my prototypes. Yeah. Um, that that you have in your lap you can talk about. But we'll release this when it's already released. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, whenever. It's fine. People can wait. <laughs> <laughs> so I have maybe 10 or 12 prototypes like actively going at any one time. Uh, I have a laser cut 8x10 that is, uh, you know, in the works and it's getting close. Um, I have... You're doing an 8x10 like this. Oh yeah, that one too, right? So there's a laser cut 8x10 field camera uh, mm -hmm. that will fold up. Um, and so basically on a, on a laser cutter I can make big pieces really fast, mm -hmm. and uh, but they're only like flat boards. And so I use like a combination of 3D printed brackets to make, you know, three-dimensional pieces with mounting brackets and mm -hmm. holes, kind of like Ikea furniture type of thing. And then just cut the big pieces out of uh, laser cut wood or acrylic. And that allows me to make big stuff quickly as opposed to just... 3D printing that takes a lot of time to do big surfaces. Yeah, yeah. and so for fun, I'm working on an 8x10 version of this thing, which is like eight times the volume, just like for handheld or, you know, sort of tripod mounted. Um, uh, portraits and, and things, which, you know, it's like kind of a novelty, but um, it's pretty fun, but it takes like more than two weeks worth of printer time on mm -hmm. a very big expensive printer that I only have one of. I've, I'm up to like 14 printers now and, yeah. and counting, but um, yeah, so that's a project I've been working on. Um, one day I would, I would like to make some um, rangefinder cameras with like working rangefinders and uh, working shutters, so you can use lenses like Kiev lenses that are mm -hmm. great that have no shutter in them. Um, but you know, I kind of have to have enough uh, simpler designs that I can be selling while I spend six months prototyping something. No, I know. get it. I get it. So you're basically looking to have a set, you know, orders that will fulfill. You can fulfill. Meanwhile, you're designing exactly. something more complicated. So all of this, I mean, is designed by you, mm -hmm. is printed by you. Mm -hmm. Is in you know put together by you and shipped by you, so it's a one man team. Yep, <laughs> uh, which is impressive. And I have to say, like I when I received this in the mail, I think probably six eight months ago, I was very impressed at the size because I didn't expect it to be. Because when you see pictures on the internet, you see a picture and you judge without having. It's always bigger than people think. It will exactly, be. and it's it's which nice is not necessarily and sturdy. <laughs> it is not heavy. This one's not heavy. The, the homunculus feels a little heavy because the lens is mm -hmm. a bit bigger and has the helical, which is metallic, mm -hmm. and the back, which is also metallic. But mm. this thing, um, I mine is uh, 127 hectare as well, and when I have a film back in it, the lens, the, uh, the cable release, a uncoupled rangefinder and the finder mm -hmm. on it, it's like 2.1 pounds or something. It's less than my Nikon. It's F. like a kilo. Yeah. Around yeah, that because I'm kilo. not a pound guy. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's it's fairly lightweight. It's nice to have. And at the end, when you're shooting four by five handheld, the biggest bulk and weight is usually your film holders. Yeah, it's 20 film holders in your pockets. Exactly. I right. carry I usually my four by five point and shoot in a Domkey F6, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's like half of the bag is the camera, the other half is film holders. Yeah. But that's just how it goes. But it's very fun, I have to say. If anyone's never tried hand holding four by five, and I know it sounds like you know, like you know, should be wrong. It's super fun. Uh, results can be surprisingly good, but there's of course many fails. Um, but when you get a good shot on four by five film, you know you got that big sheet. You can contact print it. You can do all that stuff, and it's it's really really fun. So uh, Ethan. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so like just um, hand holding stuff. Like I always liked shooting Polaroids back in the day when they were not super expensive. But right now I've been working on like uh, black and white and some color uh, reversal direct mm -hmm. positive. So um, I've been shooting a lot of like just paper in the camera at like ISO one and then developing it in a way so it just comes as as a positive five minutes later, which is yeah, that's super, super fun. fun. I've got some YouTube uh, videos on that. On that, yeah. which we were going to do today, but we didn't have the time. So what else do you have on your lap? Um, so this is just a prototype. There's only two of them, um, a buddy of mine. Just look at the size, because once Huge. it tells you what it shoots, you're going to be impressed. So that's <laughs> the size. Depressed. <laughs> Yeah, I was impressed and then I was not so impressed in yeah. the sense of like, oh, it just only shoots. Um, so it's 
It's a panoramic camera. It shoots uh, 35 millimeter, even though it's huge, um, because it's using a medium format lens. Um, it shoots- X-Band killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so it shoots uh, actually not X-Band format, but uh, one to two point four, which is twenty four by fifty eight. It's the millimeters. anamorphic like cinema. Yeah, it's it's cinema aspect ratio. In fact, if I put a film in here, no. If I pop this open, you can see the back. Uh, that's sort of the film gate right there. Yeah. I don't know if you can see. But yeah, it's, it shoots panorama on thirty five millimeter. Um, and there's only two of these in existence. One, my buddy has one uh, to test out, and I've got this one. And you know, it's got some like tolerance issues and little bits and pieces here right now, like um, this film door has tape on it because it's, you know, a millimeter uh, too thin. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tape makes it work perfectly, but I'm not gonna sell it with the not tape with on the it. Tape. Good enough to go on vacation though and shoot some pictures of Nico here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> One thing that I'll interrupt you about this camera, one of the reasons that it's a little bulkier and people might be surprised at how the size, first the lens is a medium format lens. It's a six by nine, same as mm -hmm. the homunculus. This one's a 65 because it's shooting a smaller format so it doesn't look so long. So that makes it bigger. So it's the same amount as the homunculus. Mm -hmm. But then he's got all the gears in here. So you can't really see these knobs here. There's a bunch of gears so you shoot and advance and it counts, there's a frame counter. So all of that actually adds bulk and it's because it's the technology you're using which is 3D printing, but it's not the very, very fine, what was it called, SLS or what was it? SLS, the, yeah. SLS. It's a little bit less tolerant to small pieces and 3D mm -hmm. printing doesn't let you do small little pinions or what yeah, do you call them? It, uh, gears and pinions, gears. ratchets. So it has to be a little bigger. Yeah, so um, I think it's also kind of my style, right? I could push these guys smaller um, to make it it doesn't Finer. look small in your hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, but I'm an ogre. Um, yeah, so like one of my favorite camera builders is Lucas Landers. Mm -hmm. uh, he makes these beautiful like brass and steel and aluminum cameras, but he just makes one every year or two for himself and they're He made that microscopic nice. large format yeah. camera that I featured in the news. That was yes. super cute. And I actually told him I would love to do a review on yeah. that because <laughs> it'd be so much fun. Yeah, yeah, he should do that. Um, but yeah, so Lucas really tries to make things very small and you mm -hmm. know, it's beautiful and precise. For me, um, you know, this camera has been at 13,000 feet in the rain and snow. Uh, it's been frosted over at night. It's been in the desert at 95 degrees. It's picked up sand and it's just like, it will keep working. It's kind of like a Russian tank, right? Like this is the roughest, hardest ratchet of all time, but you know, I've put 80 rolls through it and it's plastic and it works fine. Um, and so my priority is less like making everything as small and fine as possible, but just like durability first, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the number one thing people think is like, oh, it's a plastic camera, it's like a toy, but you know, it's got a perfectly good glass lens on it and it's just super beefy and durable. No, no, the, also the, drop this. the weight of this is, I mean, you pick it up and it feels like basically a plastic heavy brick. Yeah, but it and is a brick, right? It's it is a brick. Twice the size of the camera. It should be if it was made out of metal. It's not any heavier, but it's mm -hmm. um, it's beefier than you would expect, as and, am I. <laughs> yeah, well, it is, It's. I mean, it feels nice in hand, but it does, when I, I held it, I was like, is this a six by seven kind of camera? And he's like, no, it's a, panoramic camera sort of like an X-Band just a little bit shorter. He Nico make... was super disappointed when it was yeah. not medium format. I wanted it to be a 6x7 because I would totally carry this around. I mean you got the homunculus which could be that mm -hmm. but this the idea of advancing the film without a film back and all that could be was pretty cool. So Ethan um, to talk about future you were saying 8x10s what other cameras do you see in the line of production not invention? Yeah so I think um, this will be out shortly. There's some things that I have to work on with like tolerances and materials and just, um, right now it takes me eight hours to assemble this thing, which makes mm -hmm. it really, really expensive. But I think I can get a little smarter about how I print the pieces and sort of change the design a little bit so that it goes together quicker. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, um, a lot of people will see my stuff and be like, what, why is $15 worth of plastic? $200. Well, it's not really the plastic. It's about the time on the printers and the time it takes me to sit there and yeah. put everything together. And so, 
Um, I think one of the things I really want to work pretty hard on, I think people will really like this camera. I've loved shooting with it. Um, but I want to get it to a point where it's manufacturable quickly so that I can sell and them cheaper. And it's inexpensive. Like, yeah. uh, it's cheaper, so people are willing to take that. Yeah, I don't want to sell $1,000 plastic cameras. And the good thing, I sense. would say, in a positive way, if I was going to be a user of this camera, I would probably get, for $120, I would get the homunculus, and it would share the same lenses. Right. So you got, you know, two bodies, but only one lens if you want to. Yeah. And, and that would be fun. You know, so like the homunculus, you can buy a RB67 220 back now for like $35 on eBay because yeah, there's no 220, 220 film. But you can roll a uh, 35 millimeter through it and shoot panoramas. It's a little bit more awkward than this shape, you know, because it's like, I don't know if you can see, like, uh, it, it sort of sticks back. It's not yeah. just like holding it. It's not so flat. Side. Like, yeah, you basically are holding it and it's kind of like the super wide. It's yeah. kind of like a long camera more than a flat camera, which is this one. Yeah. But I I, could, I pretty like the idea. I, I did wish that one was a six by seven, mm -hmm. I told you, and I hope it comes one day. So I, I got another question because I think a lot of people that follow this YouTube channel and our Patreons, we've talked, like what's your customer reaction? I, I mean, people buy these because mm -hmm. you're obviously making them and it's happening. So what's the reaction when they get it? What's the feedback you're getting? Are people that after a while get upset at that? Are people that after a while love it or surprised about it? Tell me. Yeah, I think people have liked it a lot. Um, I am a one man band, so I have definitely shipped people cameras with errors. You know, mm -hmm. I've shipped two, 300 of these, you know, that camera and the other. Um, there are definitely like, I don't know, three or four who've gotten cameras that like, you know, either the lens won't fit perfectly. So there's a look, actually a little bit of difference in the thickness of the mounting tabs on different lenses. Mm -hmm. um, and then plastic will also, you know, swell and shrink uh, based on altitude and atmospheric pressure mm -hmm. and temperature. And so a couple of times I've had things that have shown up at, you know, somebody's house and like, hey, this doesn't mount. Um, this mount has three screws and usually I'll say, hey, FaceTime me, get an M3 or M2.5. Uh, Allen key and mm -hmm. in three minutes we will fix the problem. One thing, not that I'm, because you're here sure. and I want to be nice to you, but mm -hmm. one thing that we see is... Ask when, me the hard questions, Nico. Yeah, that's, I'm going to try to push that. Uh, but like, I've, I'm a digital shooter right now. We're shooting mm -hmm. on the, and digital cameras just have some issues too. Like then I remember Nikon, I don't know what model had, the shutter was like mm -hmm. oily and they mm -hmm. had to call mm -hmm. them all in. Sure. There's so I mean this is a one man team research is limited as mm -hmm. what time you can spare from building right. these to sell them and like I have to understand like if you get a camera like this and it's not working for one of those reasons just contact him yeah. and he'll help you out I I be we'll fix it over uh, FaceTime or FaceTime Skype or, or Skype. I will send you another one yeah and uh, Ethan doesn't seem bothered by issues that could be his fault he's totally cool with that because sometimes you hit brands where you bug them like, hey, something's wrong, and you get the reaction like, you're doing it wrong. And I've had that happen to me a couple yeah. of times, and I won't call names out, but it's nice that I can, you know, ring you up and say, hey, Ethan, this is not working correctly, what's going on? And you're like, oh, talk me through how to fix it or replace it, which is nice. Yep. I mean, like I've seen Intrepid, and I met Max and the team in person, and they have the same sort of guarantee where Anything that goes wrong, they'll replace it. They'll help you out, which is I think is awesome. And these small one-man team or small team uh, startups, I think that's the way to do it because you don't want people against you. And I feel that's the future of film is people being open to understanding that things happen mm -hmm. and there's ways through it. So instead of going online and just bashing the product, which I'm not saying people shouldn't do if they feel like it, I'm never going to stop people trolling. But you should just... First, talk to the maker and see what's going on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, uh, Ethan, anything else you want to add to our little conversation? Oh, another thing that we haven't mentioned is you've seen the colors. He also makes them all black. Yes. Because people seem concerned with the colorfulness. So, um, when I build a prototype, right, like, like this one, I generally, there are pieces that need to be black, right, just because of lightproofness mm -hmm. and a lot of the colors will sort of... <laughs> Uh, they're, Reflect they're not as, light or, or, or even um, it'll soak through, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I like to use as many contrasting colors where I can as possible just so, you know, I can, if I'm watching a mechanism and doing Yeah, this, you can see it moving yeah, or what it exactly. does. exactly. Um, but I would say, and also I think it photographs better, right? So like if it, it was all black and you take a picture of it, it's, it's very, very hard. hard to see what the difference is. I remember... Um, 
like like uh, middle school class pictures, like a kid with like very dark hair in front of a dude with a black suit is like head disappears. And that's, yeah. that's sort of like the, the reasoning for sometimes the yeah. colorful. Um, but it's also like eye catching, right? I make those uh, camera grips and like nobody would ever have written a petapixel article about me making another black plastic grip. Yeah. But if you make them in hot pink and you put them on a Leica and everybody gets upset, all of a sudden, you know, I can't afford advertising, but I can get some people's attention. Yeah, um, anger brings it like attention. Yeah, yeah, good it's good. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. People, I, I, you know, I don't want to be the guy that everybody loves to hate, but like, you know, if people are talking about it, cool, it's not right? Bad. Uh, Seventy-five percent of everything I sell is like all black, right? The other one of these that is in existence is an all black. I could not convince my tester well, friend. Well, when you got in contact with me for okay. this camera, you were like, "You want a grip?" And I was like, "I could have a grip for one of my Leica cameras." And he's like, "What color?" And I was like, "You know what? Let's make it red." Yeah. And my whole idea with the red was like everyone that shoots Leica that doesn't have a red dot sometimes get a little upset. Some people don't like it and put it black. Some people buy cameras like the M2 or the M3 that don't mm -hmm. have any color. But I have an MDA, which I use a wide angle point and shoot. And I was like, give me a red grip just to make fun of the whole red dot sort of it movement. Looks nice. And I think it looks pretty sweet. And the grip is fairly useful because I do like carrying it with a hand strap and just kind of like fast shooting, no focusing. So yeah, I have to say uh, thanks for joining the conversation, Ethan, and uh, bringing all, well, this one was mine, or well, yours to me, but bringing this to see, it's fairly cool. And if anyone has questions or anything, Maybe. you can leave a comment below. He's got a YouTube channel and uh, Instagram and all that. You can hit him down in the description. I'll leave all the, you know. It's all camera dactyl. Camera dactyl, yep. which is the name because you wanted something that people could find easily. Yeah, it I wanted could be the stupidest com. name possible. So that answers your questions and someone's curious about that. But yeah, thanks for having time for this, Ethan. And, and you, Nico. Thanks for watching, guys. If you have any questions for Ethan, um, maybe in a year or so we'll meet again and do another volume two conversation. In Albuquerque. In Albuquerque, yeah. At my worst studio. <laughs> in the heat. Yeah. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next one. Thank you.